This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. We'll hear more about them soon, but first I wanted to talk about trailers. Trailers make the world go round. Or at least, they seem to help the gaming world go round. The entire games industry practically came to a standstill last month to watch, in record-breaking amounts, the first trailer for Grand Theft Auto 6, followed only days later, in similar record-breaking amounts, by more than 50 trailers at the Game Awards. As someone who watched both of these live, I can certainly understand the hype. It's exciting to see all the new game announcements like in the years before E3 was cancelled. And it's exciting to watch the first reveal trailer from Rockstar Games in more than 7 years, the first for a Grand Theft Auto game in more than 12 years. These are the kinds of trailers that you want to watch again and again, pausing at different moments to look for easter eggs in the background, or admire the leaps in graphical quality. What I find fascinating about my obsession with trailers like this though, is that outside of them, I tend to avoid trailers altogether. And I'm not talking about simply not paying attention to them. I'm talking closing my eyes and covering my ears during some trailers at the cinema, or muting my device and looking away as they play as ads on YouTube. But if I'm so allergic to trailers generally, why do I always watch Rockstar trailers so frequently and diligently? One of my favourite trailers of all time, surprise surprise, is Red Dead Redemption 2's first trailer. It manages to capture the beauty and wonder of the game's world, as well as its harsh realities, its dirt and muck and encroaching civilization. And through the use of one cryptic line introducing us to the beautiful voice of Roger Clark, we're also introduced, quite subtly, to the story of Red Dead Redemption 2. The story of the end of the Wild West, and the end of its gangs. In about 60 seconds, Rockstar managed to capture my attention and pique my interest. I watched this trailer all the time after it came out in 2016, and every time I go back and watch it again now, I immediately want to jump back into the game. That's how I know, at least to me, that it's a successful trailer. The same could be said about Grand Theft Auto V's first trailer. This one is a little less artistic, I suppose, but then so is the game and its world. Instead, it does a fantastic job at showing off Los Santos, its variety, its intensity, the craziness of its people, and some of the activities that can be done in the game. And while this is happening, we're introduced to the voice of one of the protagonists, who, like with Red Dead Redemption 2, subtly introduces the game's story, of a man who sought to retire from a life of crime and enjoy his life in the sun with his children. But, well, you know how it is. I think I've made it abundantly clear by now that I'm more of a Red Dead guy than a GTA 5 one, but I still think this trailer does a fantastic job at introducing viewers to the game's world, and getting them interested enough without giving too much away. I think the new trailer for Grand Theft Auto 6 also does a fantastic job of that. In fact, as far as demonstrating the world goes, I think it might actually do a better job. Big sweeping shots show the vastness of Vice City and its surrounding state, Slightly closer shots show the partying nature of the location, and what appears to be social media videos show the insanity of its inhabitants, really putting the Florida Man meme to good use. Interestingly, this reveal trailer introduces its protagonist even more than its predecessors. While GTA 5 and Red Dead Redemption 2 feature fleeting appearances of Michael and Arthur, reserving their full reveals for the second trailer, GTA 6 puts Lucia front and centre, perhaps a result of the previous year's leaks, which gave us far more information about the game than we'd usually have by this point. In any case, the story itself is hardly the focus. Anyone watching this trailer is given little information about the narrative outside of the series' archetypes. And that's what I really like about Rockstar's trailers, even the longer ones don't really give too much away. For both GTA 5 and Red Dead Redemption 2, the second trailers introduced us to the characters and hinted at their stories, the third gave us a little more information about the characters and the world around them. And then we got two gameplay videos focused mostly on the open world and activities, before one final launch trailer with just enough story details to convince players to buy the game or not. But there are some trailers that I've seen over the years that have made me basically quit watching trailers altogether. Before we get to those, I'd like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Surfshark helps to protect your online identity from big companies and cyber outlaws by encrypting the information sent between your device and the internet. Using a VPN ensures that your location and download history aren't linked to your identity. And Surfshark's clean web feature blocks trackers, malware and ads to allow you safe and secure access to the internet. Perhaps the most well known and probably most used feature of a VPN is the ability to bypass geo restrictions, which is especially useful when watching content online, including with some of the media I'll discuss later in this video. Spider Man No Way Home, for example, isn't available on any streaming services in Australia, 
but with just a few clicks on Surfshark VPN, I can access both the original film and the extended cut through Netflix UK, and the multiverse is mine. You can get up to six additional months of Surfshark for free by entering the promo code REALPIXELS, one word, at surfshark.deal slash realpixels. You can use the link in the description, and Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's really no harm in giving it a go. Thanks again to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. I think the reveal of Batman v Superman was one of the coolest in comic book movie history. To be a DC fan in that room during the announcement of the first live action film featuring both Superman and Batman, you can feel the energy through the screen. And I think most of the trailers did a good job at establishing anticipation for the film, getting viewers excited to see how this fight would play out on the big screen. The last shot of the final trailer was enough to pique my interest, making me even more interested to see how this conflict might resolve itself. But it turns out I didn't actually have to watch the movie to find out. I only had to watch official trailer too. As a trailer, it's fine. It has a lot of quick cuts time with the music, but is largely slower than the other trailers, showing longer scenes, more story, and more characterization, which can be great. But then it just gives away the film's third act. It shows that this movie, titled and marketed as a battle between two of the most significant superheroes in comic book history, ends with them teaming up and fighting an even bigger baddie, a CGI alien. And it's one thing that they team up during the movie. I don't think anybody was surprised by this revelation. But to just show it in the trailer is a wild marketing move, which really undercuts a lot of the tension that the other trailers established and maintained. I also think the reveal of Wonder Woman would have been much cooler and more impactful in the movie if the trailer hadn't given it away. But it has a lot of logic as a marketing decision, so that's at least understandable. These last shots really feel like a symptom of DC rushing to establish its cinematic universe, hoping to catch up with Marvel, which is already 12 films deep, before releasing its second putting a major reveal in a trailer more than four months before the film even drops. It certainly wasn't the first film to include spoilers in its trailers, nor is it the most egregious at doing so, but it's one of the first that I really took notice of and made me more cautious when watching trailers from this point. Essentially, if I knew I was going to watch the movie or TV series or play the game, if I didn't need any convincing, I'd avoid trailers like The Plague, scrolling past on social media or briefly leaving the cinema until it had finished playing. Unfortunately, this issue came back to haunt me in 2021 with Spider-Man No Way Home. To be clear, I didn't actually watch any of the trailers for this film, but with the teaser trailer alone getting well over a quarter of a billion views in 24 hours, not to mention the countless news articles and rumours and leaks, it was practically impossible to use the internet without discovering that Doc Ock and Green Goblin would be returning from the original Spider-Man movies, and Electro from the Amazing Spider-Man films. According to Tom Holland, the original plan for the film's marketing was to solely focus on the conflict between Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, with the villain's appearances to be saved as a surprise. And while this would have been incredibly difficult, especially with Jamie Foxx and Alfred Molina's casting being leaked over a year before the film released, and then both of them openly and confidently confirming their appearance months before the first trailer, I can't help but feel that the experience of watching the movie would have been improved by maintaining this surprise. The reveals of all the characters are done so well, it's a shame they were all spoiled by the marketing materials. What's more is that the surprises that the film actually kept were essentially spoiled as a result of this. The entire concept of Doc Ock not recognising Tom Holland's Peter was predicated on the fact that Tobey Maguire's Peter exists. That this point was even highlighted in one of the film's trailers You're not Peter Parker. proves how central it is to the story overall. And while I think it was wise to withhold Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield from the film's marketing, and the reveal itself was incredibly memorable and exciting, their presence was essentially spelled out by the presence of their villains. One could argue that this made it even more exciting, that knowing that they were probably going to appear made the reveal pay off even more. And I don't disagree entirely, but I can't help but think that this excitement would likely have been enhanced even more if Doc Ock and Green Goblin had just appeared completely unexpectedly. Instead of having months to theorise and analyse on social media, we'd have had about an hour, quietly in our own heads at the cinema, an interesting thought experiment that was unfortunately not possible due to the film's trailers. Interestingly, a recent trailer that I regret watching is for another Spider-Man product. See, I still enjoy watching games showcases like Nintendo Direct and Wholesome Direct. Ultimately, they're just extended advertisements feeding into the perpetual capitalism of such a lucrative industry, but they remind me of the excitement of watching a different advertisement trade show when I was younger, so I'll look past that. Probably my favourite parts of these showcases, and what they largely consist of anyway, are the reveal trailers for newly announced games, especially indie games. And I've discovered a lot of new favourites this way, so I have no immediate plans to stop watching these showcases for this reason. 
So when I was watching the PlayStation Showcase in May last year, and a gameplay preview started playing for Marvel's Spider-Man 2, a sequel to the 2018 game that I thoroughly enjoyed and have played through at least twice, I decided not to look away, and almost immediately regretted it. Don't get me wrong, it's a great trailer, and anyone who was on the fence about buying the game is much more likely to make a decision by the end of it, but I already knew that I'd be buying the game, so I'm not sure why I decided to watch the video and spoil more of the story than I'd like to have seen, but I did. I'm not sure what had officially been revealed up to this point for those vigilant enough to watch new trailers or read new developer interviews, but all I knew was that the game had two playable Spider-Men and featured Kraven and Venom. So when the gameplay preview opens with Peter Parker's Spider-Man wearing the symbiote suit and using its abilities, a narrative beat that most of the game's first act subtly builds towards, it's safe to say that I was surprised and somewhat disappointed to discover this during a trailer, same with the reveal of Lizard. Ultimately, I think a lot of my problems aren't just with trailers specifically, but marketing generally. Now obviously I don't harbour any ill will towards the marketing staff or trailer editors. Their entire job is essentially to convince audiences to consume these products, and it's safe to say that they seem to have done so successfully. Spider-Man 2 became PlayStation's fastest selling first party game, No Way Home broke several box office records and became the sixth highest grossing film of all time, and Batman v Superman, while not quite reaching Marvel's level, broke into the top 50 and had the fourth biggest opening of all time, at least at the time. Clearly these trailers work, even for franchises whose name does a lot of the work for them. But I'm always curious to know how different the experience might have been with minimal marketing, or even basically no marketing. And I'm clearly not alone in this. Brian Intaha, Senior Creative Director at Insomniac Games, wanted the same thing for Spider-Man 2. On this game, I actually didn't want to show anything. Like I was, I drove PR, app, it, everybody crazy. I'm like, I didn't even want to do a preview tour for the game. Like I wanted to show nothing. But of course, when your position is one of the biggest blockbuster hits of the year, the game that is expected to not only sell well, but to help sell its console, or help to push a new cinematic universe, or help revive cinema after a global pandemic. You can't show nothing. So you pick something that will get people talking. What's a seven to 12 minute sequence that we can show that kind of highlights some like, like, so you guys have things to talk about for an hour. I mean, I'm not giving you trade secrets away. That's what you're doing. You want to get people excited about what's new, what's different. And unsurprisingly, it works. Obviously the sales numbers speak for themselves, but so do the dozens of news stories and analysis articles and discussions or breakdown videos with hundreds of thousands of views. Like it or not, this stuff works. There's no way around it for blockbuster releases of this size. And I think that's what makes my experience with not so blockbuster releases even more memorable. It's not lost on me that the examples I've mentioned so far are all superhero movies or games, and most of the other trailers I have in mind that I haven't mentioned are for big blockbuster releases too. And in fairness, these are the hardest trailers to avoid nowadays. If any social media algorithm detects that you have a slight interest in any of these franchises, those platforms essentially become unusable if you wanted to avoid any screenshots or clips or discussions about those trailers, even with the use of muted words. But if you're trying to avoid any spoiler-related discussions about a not-so-mainstream indie game or a successful but not quite record-breaking film or television series, there's little to worry about and the experience is almost always preserved. Most of my favourite pieces of media from recent years have fit into these categories, where I'm at little risk of seeing any trailers before movies or YouTube videos or on social media. Rectify, Drive My Car, Grease, The Great, Sound of Metal, The Good Place. All incredible pieces of media for which I went mostly unspoiled, having not watched any promotional material. One of my favourite films of last year is Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron, a film that forewent all marketing upon its original Japanese release. No trailers, no synopsis, not even a cast list. The only thing that was released was a very vague and very pretty poster. And yet it worked. The reputation of Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli was enough for it to become the studio's biggest opening to date, make it to the top 100 highest grossing films in Japan, and within the top 20 anime films in Japan. It was so successful that it began to leave marketing executives concerned about the state of their traditional advertising methods. But like it or not, I think they needn't be concerned. This secretive marketing technique was largely scrapped by G-Kids upon acquiring the film's North American distribution rights, with the release of trailers, a synopsis, and a full cast list. And of course, it was all done beautifully, handled with immense respect for Miyazaki, Ghibli, the film, and the audience. But part of me wonders what it would have been like if it had not been done at all. Even as someone who did my best to avoid absolutely everything about the film, I saw more than I'd like, more than the Japanese audience had seen before they watched the film. I wish I could have preserved the feeling that the original artist had intended. 
or since marketing is basically a prerequisite for any modern media product anyway, I wish they could have just stuck with the final teaser trailer, which focuses on Miyazaki's history and reputation, and only shows beautiful but brief and ambiguous shots of the new film with critical praise to entice audiences. Would that have been enough to convince audiences to spend their money to watch the film? Maybe. But for the biggest film that G-Kids has distributed in its 15 year history, is that experiment worth the risks? And I think that question is ultimately why I've come to peace with trailers. It would be fascinating to see big studios and franchises experiment with minimal or no marketing for their products. But ultimately I know they put too much money on the table to risk letting the art fail. And smaller, often independent creators simply cannot perform such experiments, as the lack of name recognition means audiences aren't even likely to discover their art without an enticing trailer, even if it does involve spoiling an element here or there. So if you're also feeling like modern marketing campaigns are giving away too much of the magic of art, consider approaching it the same way that I try to do. Watch the trailers until the moment you decide that you're going to watch, play or purchase the product, and then immediately stop watching all trailers. Consider muting words or accounts on social media until you're ready to see spoilers again, or just consider staying away from social media generally. I think we could all do with a break from there every now and then. In the meantime, I'll continue to watch all of Rockstar's trailers and analyze every frame until the game comes out. I just hope the second GTA 6 trailer follows in its predecessor's footsteps and doesn't spoil too much of the story for me. I'll let you know, I'm sure it'll be here soon. I'll be waiting for it. Any day now.